Welcome everyone to the second suite of video presentations on the capital asset pricing model. Uh, in today's discussion, we are going to be uh, explaining some theory behind the capital asset pricing model, and we're going to explain that theory with, re with respect to a small market for stocks and then a large market for stocks. In reality, there is a massive market for stocks, and the idea behind the capital asset pricing model is essentially that investors are going to hold very well diversified portfolios amongst this massive market for stocks. And because they're holding such well diversified portfolios, they care very little about company and industry specific risk in coming up with prices and therefore expected returns on assets. So they care in almost entirely about systematic risk. But to get to that very large market concept, we're going to illustrate things with a small market of just three stocks and then say a medium sized market of nine stocks so you can actually understand the derivation of this model. So first of all, let's talk about the model and its assumptions. Uh, we're gonna have an agenda over three classes. In our first suite of videos, we talked about risk and expected return of a portfolio. Now we're getting into the specifics of the capital asset pricing model. And in a subsequent suite of videos, we're gonna talk about the implementation of the model. That is the practical way you estimate a discount rate using this model and some of its limitations. So let's give you a bit of a history lesson behind the capital asset pricing model. This model was developed more than 50 years ago in the 1960s. In the 1960s, some very clever researchers, um, Sharp, Lintner, and Mossen, were trying to understand why investors pay different prices for different assets. To flip that around, and this is analogous to the way we talked about bond pricing, we talked about the yield to maturity on bonds being the flip side of the price. A higher price paid for a bond basically means you're factored in a lower return on that bond. Well, you can think about stocks in the same way, and indeed any asset in the same way. If you're trying to work out why investors pay higher prices for some asset and lower prices for another asset, you can think in terms of, well, why do investors factor in a lower return on some assets and a higher return on other assets? And so these very clever researchers were trying to come up with a theory about how the market prices assets or estimates expected returns on those assets. And they came up with the capital asset pricing model under a set of very limited assumptions. The idea when you are doing economic theory is that you try to collapse a very complex world into the smallest number of assumptions that you possibly can. You try to make the world as simple as possible and see what answer you get. And then incrementally, you relax those assumptions and make your analysis a little bit more closer to reality and see what answers you get with the relaxation of those assumptions. That's crucial because if you try to model all of the real world complexity right from the very beginning, you don't get anywhere. It's just too complex. And so what these researchers did was say, we are going to adopt the assumptions of a perfect capital market. And in that perfect, capital market, there's going to be infinite liquidity, there's going to be complete information amongst investors, and all investors are going to be able to borrow and lend at the risk-free rate of interest. And under this very limited, restricted set of assumptions, you get a particular equation which we're going to cover later. So at the outset, it's important to understand that this model was not initially designed to be a perfect representation of reality. It's a model. It's an idea, right? But we have used it as practitioners as a handy way to estimate discount rates because we need discount rates for discounted cash flow valuation. But unfortunately, as practitioners, we have overstated the benefits of this model because we don't have a perfect capital market, because we don't have complete information amongst investors, because investors can't borrow and lend at the risk-free rate interest risk-free rate of interest. Because these perfect capital market assumptions don't hold in reality, the model itself doesn't hold as well as we would like in reality. There are risks other than systematic risk, also called market risk or economic risk, which do affect the prices of assets and therefore do affect discount rates, which the model doesn't capture. 
So we have to get out in front of this right now and say, this is a starting point for thinking about risk. It's a starting point for thinking about discount rates. We've got to start somewhere so you can do computations to get develop some idea about how risk and returns and asset prices interact, but it shouldn't be the end point. And if you try to implement the capital asset pricing model without any consideration of all of the other risks, which in fact affect asset prices and expected returns, you are going to materially misestimate discount rates. So let's get started with the development of a theory. This is not a mathematical derivation. Uh, in some other, or other more advanced finance courses, students in fact do a mathematical replication of the analysis which was done in the 1960s. But those are higher level and in fact PhD level courses in finance to do that mathematical derivation. We're not doing that. We are going to have a high level discussion of the assumptions and the implications of those assumptions as they lead to this equation. So I wanna start with the investment opportunity set. So imagine that there is a very large number of individual risky assets that you could purchase. These assets could be stocks, they could be bonds, they could be artwork, they could be vintage cars, they can be property. These are all the individual risky assets that you could possibly buy. That set of individual risky assets um, is your investment universe. In our previous discussion, we worked out that if we combine assets into portfolios, we can come up with what we call efficient portfolios. And they are efficient in a very particular way. We used the term that mean variance efficiency. That means there is a set of portfolios which offers the highest expected return for a given level of risk, or in other words, the lowest risk for the same expected return. Remember we combined CVS and Microsoft and Chevron into different portfolios, and we worked out that there were some portfolios which were feasible for the investor, and some portfolios which no investor, regardless of that investor's risk preference, would rationally buy. So imagine that you applied that idea to all of the individual risky assets that you could buy and formed a very large set of portfolios and combined them together. And then imagine that you plotted all of those portfolios that were efficient as a line. So this line where you see investment opportunity set, imagine I combine all of these individual risky assets into different portfolios, just like we did for CVS, Chevron and Microsoft. And I wrote down as red crosses, all of the portfolios I could form. And then there are some of these portfolios which are dominant. They offer the highest expected return for a given level of risk. And I'm gonna highlight those portfolios in purple. And those portfolios plot along this blue curve. And they end here. That set of portfolios which offer the highest expected return for each level of risk, that is called the efficient frontier. The efficient frontier is the suite of portfolios which offers the highest expected return for a given level of risk. And that is the only set of portfolios that rational investors would actually purchase. And you can see that on this, this next chart. Now, of course, in reality, investors, they have different views on what assets are gonna do well and what assets are gonna do poorly. But those different views of investors aren't factoring into our, our analysis here. Because one of the assumptions of the capital asset pricing model is that all investors have the same information set and all investors have the same expectations for the expected return on each asset, the correlation of returns between pairs of assets and the volatility of returns on each individual asset. And we say that the volatility of a portfolio is entirely determined by the weights of the assets in the portfolio, the correlation of returns between pairs of assets, and the standard deviation of returns on each individual asset. Those were all the components which made up our portfolio variance matrix, which we worked through in the previous class. And if we all agree on the input into that matrix, we all come up with this efficient frontier. So the efficient frontier represents the section on the edge of this investment opportunity sets, set which is above the minimum variance portfolio. It's a feasible set of portfolios. 
But depending upon your risk preference as an individual, you might hold a different portfolio. So I've already said, all of my money's in the market, except for an apartment, and I'm a bit sad right now because the market's down 30%. But my portfolio plots somewhere up here. It's a relatively high risk portfolio and offers relatively high expected returns. Whereas someone who is retired, living on a, a fixed income from that retirement that doesn't have the opportunity to continue to work harder in an economic downturn, may have a lower risk preference. So might have a portfolio that plots somewhere here on the efficient frontier. We have different risk preferences, we hold different portfolios, but they're all rational portfolios to hold. They are contingent upon our risk preference. That's different to someone who is gonna hold a portfolio that plots in the middle here. That person is acting in an irrational manner. That person is holding a portfolio which doesn't offer any increase in expected returns for the risk of that portfolio. That person's portfolio is offering low returns but higher risk than this other portfolio, which we could call portfolio A on the efficient frontier. It's also offering lower returns for the same level of risk as my portfolio, which we could call portfolio B. So no rational investor is gonna buy portfolio X because that person could do better by holding lower risk in portfolio A or getting higher returns in portfolio B. Now I want to illustrate this idea with a small market. Now we're not gonna replica replicate the spreadsheet computations in this particular class, but all of the spreadsheet computations are available to you in the corresponding Excel file. These, co these computations are just like we did for our three asset portfolio of Chevron, CVS and Microsoft in the previous class. But in this instance, I'm using real world data for three different stocks. Nike, Merck, a pharmaceutical company, and Boeing. I've compiled estimates of expected returns for those stocks and the volatility of their returns. I've also compiled estimates of their correlations. Now they're not mechanically determined by historical data, but they are broadly informed by some historical movements of their share prices. So I wanted to give this a real world flavor, but I'm not necessarily aligning perfectly with historical data. I'm going to combine these assets into many different portfolios and in this small market, we are going to recreate that efficient frontier to, to give you an understanding of how it would actually work. The table that you see has expected returns, volatility and correlations, and it also has covariances. And recall that covariances are just correlation coefficient times the standard deviation of each individual asset. So for example, take Nike with Merck, the covariance of 0 0.0088 is equal to the correlation coefficient of 0.2 for Nike and Merck times the 22% standard deviation for Nike and the 20% standard deviation for Merck. So covariance, which I can write as COV, is equal to correlation, which we often illustrate with the Greek letter rho, times standard deviation, which we often illustrate with the Greek letter sigma, times another standard deviation, illustrated with the Greek letter sigma. So you would say the covariance between Nike and Merck with an NM subscript is equal to their correlation with an NM subscript times the standard deviation for Nike times the standard deviation for Merck. So suppose that I plot these three individual assets on a typical scatter plot that you can see here. I've got standard deviation on the horizontal axis, expected return on the vertical axis, and I've plotted the individual volatility and expected return for each stock. No rational investor would buy, buy Boeing on its own because that person would buy Nike or Merck because Merck offers a higher expected return for lower risk and Nike offers a higher expected return for lower risk than Boeing. Recalling our normal distribution, um, a normal distribution has about 68% of observations, one standard deviation either side of the mean. So if you look at the Nike expected return and volatility, 
The Nike expected return is 9%, volatility is 22%, one standard deviation either side of the mean is minus 13% to plus 31%, and that captures 68% of observations in a normal distribution. Now recall, stock returns are not in fact normally distributed. We observe a high frequency of extreme stock returns compared to what you would predict by a normal distribution, but a normal distribution is a reasonable starting point for thinking about risk. Um, for another example, there's a, a roughly a two-thirds chance or a 70% chance the Merck stock return is going to be minus 11.5% to 28.5%. That's one standard deviation either side of Merck's expected return of 8.5%. Well, what happens if we form portfolios? So what I did in this analysis is to construct 66 portfolios in which the weight in each individual stock ranges from zero to 100% in 10% increments. So for example, I said one portfolio was gonna have 0% uh, in Nike, 10% in Merck, 90% in Boeing. Another portfolio might have 10% in Nike, 20% in Merck, and 70% in Boeing. And I did that over and over again to construct 66 different portfolios where any stock would have zero, 10%, 20%, 30%, all the way to 100%, and I counted for all the combinations. So we would say in this universe I've created that just has these three stocks, the red dots plus the three individual assets, they re that represents the investment opportunity set. These are all the individual assets and all the portfolios I could form in this theoretical small universe that I've invented. Now, it's rational for investors to buy some of those portfolios, but not others. And I'm gonna illustrate those rational choices on the next slide. If we zoom in and to some of those red dots and I make them bigger and put them in green, uh, green dots, you can see I've constructed the set of efficient portfolios. Those green dots represent all the portfolios that for each level of risk offers the highest expected return, and for each level of um, return offers the lowest volatility. They plot on the edge of that investment opportunity set. So for example, uh, you take this portfolio that has a fairly high weight in Nike, that portfolio dominates all these portfolios in this lower section. It offers higher expected return and lower risk. These portfolios to the left-hand side here, they dominate all these portfolios below and to the right for the same reason. But a rational investor might buy just Nike. The rational investor might hold plenty of weight in Merck and some weight in Boeing. There are some of these portfolios, which I'm illustrating in this extract, extracted table on the right-hand side, that still have a small weight in Boeing, even though Boeing's a volatile investment offering low returns. If you look at the individual detail for Boeing, it offers the highest individual volatility and the lowest expected return. But because its correlation with Nike and Merck is only 40%, and 30% respectively, there is the possibility that an investor might hold a small weight in Boeing for that diversification benefit. So some, these two portfolios that offer expected returns of 8.65% and 8.7%, they have a 10% weight in Boeing, which reduces their volatility. So the person in retirement, if these are all the investments that person could possibly make, is going to hold that low risk portfolio. It's not as low risk as that person would like, but it's the best that person can do. That minimum risk portfolio, offering that expected return of 8.65% and standard deviation of 15.9%, that portfolio has approximately a 70% chance of returns from minus 7% to plus 25%. That's one standard deviation either side of the average. That is a narrower range than Nike on its own or Merck on its own because of that diversification benefit. So now, instead of facing the possibility of losing 13% of your wealth with a one standard deviation shift, 
you're now only facing the possibility of losing 7% of your wealth with a one standard deviation shift. So moving on to the capital asset pricing model, having explained this idea of diversification, how does that flow through to the equation that we are introducing? Imagine that we take that analysis and expand it to many, many assets in the portfolio. Uh, we've already said previously in the portfolio variance matrix discussion that the variance of portfolio is a weighted sum of the covariances of all pairs of assets. Remember that I emphasised that if you're thinking about portfolio variance, within each cell of that matrix, you want to have the weight of the asset in the row times the weight of the asset in the column times the covariance of returns on that pair of assets. And that means we're doing a weighted sum because we're adding up all the cells of the covariances of all the pairs of assets. Now imagine you've got 20 risky assets, not three like we had in our very small market, 20. That means our grid, our portfolio variance matrix now has 400 cells, 20 down the left-hand side, 20 cells going across, 20 times 20 is 400 cells within that portfolio variance matrix. There are 20 cells going down the diagonal and they are going to be the variance components because we said down the diagonal you've got the weight of an asset with itself times its variance. So you would have the weight of asset A times the weight of asset A times the covariance of asset A with itself, that was in the top left-hand corner of the matrix. Well, that's just the weight of asset squared times the variance of returns on asset A. So you would say that amongst these 400 cells, 20 cells are a variance contribution to the total risk of the portfolio, and 380 cells contribute to risk via covariances, by how assets move together. Now, I say there are 190 unique covariant cells because the cells on the mirror image of the matrix are identical. So all the cells down the bottom left-hand corner relative to the diagonal are equivalent to cells on the top right-hand corner of the matrix on the, to the right and above the diagonal. So what this illustrates at a high level is that when you put very, a very large number of assets in a portfolio, the relative contribution of the variance of any individual assets to the total portfolio risk is going to begin to diminish. As you have 100 assets, you'd have 10,000 cells in the grid. You have 100 cells going down the diagonal and 9,900 covariance terms. As you go to 1,000 assets, you've got a million cells in the grid you've got a thousand terms down the diagonal, you've got 999,000 cells on the off diagonal elements. So as you have a huge number of assets in the portfolio, the relative contribution to portfolio risk from an individual asset specific risk becomes very low. The relative contribution to the risk of your portfolio from assets moving together becomes very high. And by assets moving together, we start to introduce the flavour of systematic risk because what causes asset prices to move together? Economic shocks. So just this past couple of weeks, we've been exposed to a very large economic shock. The global economy is likely to be in recession due to the onset of COVID-19. Economic activity in many states of the United States and in many countries has been substantially reduced. And we've seen share prices fall around about 25 or 30 per cent, coinciding with this reduction in economic activity. That, my friends, is an example of systematic risk. Those share prices didn't fall because there was something unique about Ford or Planet Fitness or CVS. There was something systematic about this that affected the earnings and the cash flows of all of these companies, and they all moved together. And that is a risk which you can't get rid of in your portfolio just by holding more and more assets. But I can diversify away as an investor the risk of any individual stock. So whether GM makes a faulty vehicle or in fact develops a great new energy efficient vehicle, is going to be not correlated with the risk that Planet Fitness ex expands to too many gyms and so cannibalises its, its own market. 
or the risk that um, Delta has a plane crash so people stop flying Delta. Those risks are uncorrelated and I can offset that individual company specific risk through diversification, but I can't diversify away all of this economic or market wide risk. And that's where we get to this concept of diversifiable and non-diversifiable risk. As you increase the number of assets in your portfolio, and I say stocks, but it could be any asset. It can be property, it can be art, it can be bonds and so on. You minimise the contribution to your portfolio risk from diversifiable factors, also called non-systematic or firm-specific risk or unique risk, but you aren't eliminating the systematic risk, which is also called the non-diversifiable risk from your portfolio. Now I can form a portfolio which has low systematic risk. So for example, putting my money in cash has low systematic risk. It's a low return investment, but my cash holdings, because up to a certain threshold of about a quarter of a million dollars are protected by the government, that cash is not exposed to systematic risk. It's a very low risk portfolio, but that's not a risk reduction because of diversification. It's a risk reduction from choosing an asset that has low systematic risk. Buying utility stocks has below average systematic risk. Utility stocks typically have what we call a beta estimate of around about 0.6 or 0.7. If I buy technology stocks, they typically have a beta estimate of around about 1.2 or 1.3. They have higher systematic risk. And we get to the measurement of beta a bit later. But the point is that some assets have very low systematic risk. Some assets have moderate systematic risk. Some assets have high systematic risk but I can't eliminate the systematic risk from my portfolio just by holding more and more assets. I can lower systematic risk by buying low systematic risk investments, but that's not a diversification benefit. Right? It still means that if this theory is true, what I'm going to do as an investor if I'm rational is start to hold a very well diversified portfolio to minimize my idiosyncratic or asset specific risk exposure but that diversification is not going to flow through to a reduction in my systematic risk. And that's gonna matter for the equation that we're gonna see soon. So I wanna illustrate this again with an even larger market, make this a bit more real world, all right? So suppose I grab 29 stocks from the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and I actually did these computations roughly 12 months ago. I grabbed 29 stocks from that index, there should be 30 stocks in that index, but one of them was only recently uh, added to the index, so there wasn't a sufficient trading history to have 30 stocks for analysis. I ranked them from largest to smallest market cap, and when I did the numbers, Microsoft was the biggest company, Travelers Companies, it's an insurance company, was the lowest, comp lowest market cap stock. So I ranked them from the largest to the smallest market capitalization, and I selected the largest company and made that a one asset portfolio. I added a second stock, which at the time was Apple, and made this a two asset portfolio. And I allocated portfolio weights according to their market capitalization. Right, that's the way the S&P 500 index is constructed. It's a market capitalization weighted average of 500 large listed stocks in the United States. So in my two asset portfolio, I would hold half of my money in Microsoft and half of my money in Apple. I added a third stock to the portfolio. That was Johnson & Johnson. With that third stock on a market capitalization weighted basis, Microsoft would have 41.9% weight, Apple would have 41.1% weight, and Johnson & Johnson would have 17% weight. And I kept going, I kept adding stocks to this portfolio until I had 29 portfolios. And what I'm gonna do is illustrate this curve that you can see here, that's in every corporate finance textbook. I'm gonna illustrate that curve with these 29 different portfolios, adding one stock at a time. I estimated the covariance of returns on each pair of stock using 10 years of historical data using weekly returns. I used that covariance information to estimate the 29 portfolio variance matrices to underpin the 29 portfolios. And I use that to estimate the variance and standard deviation of those 29 portfolios. 
So I'm going to replicate over and over again the portfolio variance matrix that we illustrated in our previous presentation using this data set. A snapshot of the portfolio weights appears here. It's not every portfolio, but you can see that at the 29 portfolio level, I've got 13% in Microsoft, 13% in Apple. I have 4% in Procter & Gamble. I've got 1% in American Express. I've got 2% in Nike. So you can see that as I'm increasing stocks, I'm becoming more and more well diversified. Now, what does that do for the risk of my portfolio? It's illustrated here. Um, as we increase the number of stocks, the standard deviation of the annual returns is coming down. And you can see that it flattens out here uh, when you get to around about 20 stocks. The incremental risk reduction as you go from 20 stocks to 30 stocks for these, 30 portfolio, these 29 portfolios, the incremental risk reduction isn't very large in this example as you go from 20 to 29 stocks in the portfolio. Why isn't it very large? It's because I'm only selecting from a set of very large liquid companies. So these are relatively low risk companies on a relative basis to begin with. If you were to do this analysis and extend this graph for many more companies and moving into mid cap and smaller cap companies, you're going to see relatively more incremental risk reduction as you go from 50 to 100 stocks. So to be truly well diversified, you really want to hold somewhere between at least 50 stocks in a portfolio, possibly 100 or more stocks, then you would have quite a high degree of diversification in your portfolio. And the incremental risk reduction as you go from 100 to 200 to 1,000 is quite modest. But as we go from an individual stock all the way down to 20 stocks, the standard deviation falls from 22.4% down to 13.9%. That is a 38% reduction in the volatility of that portfolio as we go from one to 20 stocks. And this is risk, which we can't eliminate any further just by holding more and more stocks. So that level of volatility of about 14% in this fictional medium-sized universe, that's the level of volatility we are exposed to that we can't get rid of just through more and more diversification. So to summarize, our total risk in our portfolio, our portfolio variance, is the sum of two parts. It's the sum of unsystematic risk, which we could call company or industry specific risk, and systematic risk. Systematic risk is any risk that affects a large number of assets altogether. There could be uncertainty about general economic conditions, interest rates, inflation, monetary policy, fiscal policy. It's any sort of event which is going to cause earnings and cash flows to move in the same direction for a large number of securities. Unsystematic risk is any risk that affects a single security. It can be an announcement relating to a single company regarding sales, costs, patents, lawsuits, CEO's health. But in reality, it becomes very challenging to label an individual risk as systematic or unsystematic. Um, take for example, um, when I pre pre prepared this slide a year ago, tariffs were making all the headlines in the news. Right, right now, all the headlines are about COV-19, COVID-19. But a year ago, it was all about what the tariffs are gonna be on steel and aluminum, which is often imported from China, Korea, and Canada. There was a threat of these tariffs. Tariffs were ultimately imposed, and there was lots of concern in the market about how that affects car manufacturers in particular. I can partially diversify away from this risk by buying steel companies and car manufacturers. So I can benefit from tariffs that benefit uh, domestic steel producers, but I lose by holding Ford and GM because they are going to lose sales because their input costs are going to increase. So on the one hand, you could say that th the threat of tariffs is in part a risk affecting the overall economy. On the other hand, you could say it's partly a diversifiable risk because I can hold many companies and that's gonna mitigate the impact of my portfolio from that event.
We know it's a market-wide event because when tariffs were announced, and every time there's new news about whether tariffs are going to be increased or taken away, the whole market moves together. Um, Caterpillar moves in the same direction as car manufacturers, right? Because when cars are more expensive, people buy less cars, people have less discretionary spending, that flows through to other industries. It flows through to agriculture, and therefore less demand for people that supply machines to assist in agriculture. These are our flow on effects. But at the same time, you could say, well, I can partly diversify away this risk. Take climate change. You could say that climate change and the regulatory response to that change as we move to lower emissions sources of energy, well, that's a risk affecting the entire market. It's going to increase the cost of energy production. Um, but in the long term, we're going to have lower emissions and it's going to be beneficial. There's going to be workers who work in high emissions energy industries who are going to lose their jobs. There's going to be workers who are going to transition towards lower emissions energy sources like wind and solar and batteries uh, to store energy. They are going to benefit. So climate change, the regulatory response to that change is a systematic risk. But you could also say it's a risk that disproportionately affects particular industries, namely manufacturing and electricity generation, more so than services businesses. Right? Yoga instructors and spin classes and restaurants are less affected by climate change compared to a manufacturer that has uh, lots of energy as an input and therefore is going to experience high increases in cost compared to possibly competitors in other countries that don't necessarily have the same constraints placed on it. So you could say that in part, climate change and the regulatory response to climate change are in part a diversifiable risk because I can hold money in service industries, I can invest in technology companies, but I can also invest in oil companies and coal-fired power generation companies and utilities. So is this a diversifiable risk or is it a systematic risk? The key point is that in a textbook sense or in the classroom, it's quite easy to come up with the examples that are clearly systematic risk, like reductions in interest rates announced by the US Federal Reserve, versus unsystematic risk where the CEO dies in a plane crash. Right, that's clearly a company specific event. But those obvious examples aren't the reality of most risks that you face when you're forming a portfolio. Most risks, there is some ambiguity about whether you would label that risk as systematic or unsystematic. It's really some combination of both. Right, but the key point is that we have now introduced a basic understanding that investors are really going to care about systematic risk when they're coming up with prices and therefore expected returns on assets. They're going to care about less unsystematic risk because investors are clever and they can hold well diversified portfolios that are going to be largely immunized against asset specific risk, unsystematic risk. So they are only going to factor into asset prices risks that they really care about, which in this theoretical world is just systematic risk. So in the next presentation, we're going to move towards actually estimating the equation known as the capital asset pricing model.